and sweet. I love it, right? Go we'll change it up a bit. We're audible in it. Today is just today's an audible day, right? We saw the defensive formation. We saw we saw some advantage, and I guess we took it. I don't know. Is that what they do? Audible. I don't know. Whatever. Whatever. Well, good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing this evening? Good. 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 Um, you know, Pastor Daniel's feeling. Uh, he's been feeling a little under the weather, so um, I kind of just stepped in. So um, when you know, usually how we do it is on a Sunday or a Thursday, the regular teacher, if they're going to be out, we have a, a different book we go through. So we're going to be in First Peter chapter two this evening. If you guys want to turn there, First Peter chapter two. And then again, this this week, this this weekend, this Sunday starts off uh, Palm Sunday. Then we start off the Holy Week, um, the Passion Week of Christ, which is a always exciting time. It's always a good thing to remember. Uh, and sometimes, um, you know, maybe maybe we we just think about it and we remember the whole week and and, and the resurrection and Good Friday and everything uh, once a year. And it should be something obviously continually um, upon our hearts and mind because of what. What Christ has done for us, and always that reminder, and it uh, kind of goes with what we're talking about this evening. Um, we're gonna read. We're gonna. If you've ever read First and Second Peter, there's so much in this these small letters. So I'm only taking like verses nine through twelve, because again, like there's just there's there's a lot in here, a lot of just good, just good stuff. But I want to start at verse four, and then uh, we'll read through from verse twelve, and uh, go from this. Um, and come to him as to a living stone which has been rejected by men but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappoint disappointed. This precious value then is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed. Verse 9 now, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you, you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the things in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Let's pray one more time, just because uh, it, there's just a lot in here. Lord, as, um, help me to be clear in presenting this message. We thank you for your word, Lord, that it's living, it's active, that it doesn't come back void, and we pray that it would just have an effect on your people this evening, and that you would be honored and glorified, Lord, in your name. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Um, now, this is, uh, I was kind of listening to the last study that Pastor Zeke did in regards to to this book, if we have an understanding of of First uh, Peter, uh, the occasion that Peter's writing to is to Christians who are spread throughout the Roman Empire who are going through persecution. Right? Um, as as uh, as Christianity was continuing to to grow and to grow, you know, Rome, for the most part, in, in the uh, a couple centuries after after uh, Peter and, and the the first century church, um, the the persecution on Rome on a, on the Christians from Rome would intensify. It would become even like a, a empire wide thing. But at this point, it's just people started realizing that the 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 Christians were different from the Jewish people, the, the Jewish religion. There was a, there was something different about them because um, for a time they were kind of coupled together as one thing. So they were kind of under that umbrella. Uh, Judaism at the time was seen as a as an acceptable religion to the Roman Empire. So they kind of because Christianity first was, you know, um, came through origin through the through the Jewish nation, so they thought, okay, everything's good. But as they as it continued to progress, they realized, okay, these uh, these these people are different. They're 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 different. They're not a they're not a recognized religion, and so we kind of they're they're suspicious with suspicion 
with them. So what started happening is, you know, there was persecution, there was, there was trials, there was tribulation, and, um, and even during this time, but roughly around 64 AD, the church has only been around about 30 years or so. Um, Christians are still, the, it's, it's spreading, but persecution is happening, and, and the question, and, the, and it's going on, okay, how do, we, how do we navigate? How do we deal with everything that's going on? What do we do um, when, when these situations are happening? And, and Peter writes to these churches to encourage them and to, and to remind them of the living hope that they have in Christ Jesus. And that's kind of where we, we pick up in, um, in chapter 2. Chapter 2, kind of the theme with chapter 2, which, which is um, an awesome theme, is, is this unity that we have in Christ, in God. There's, there's, uh, there's potential sometimes as people, when, uh, when, especially when we're going through rough times, to kind of like, I don't know, go in isolation mode where we just kind of want to <clears throat> be on our own and you know, just deal with everything however we see it and, and kind of push people away. Um, that's, that's one of our natural reactions, I think, at times. And, and even sometimes as, as Christians, we, uh, you know, um, yeah, obviously there's, there's certain times where we need time to, if, if there's a loss or things like that, to grieve and to deal with stuff. Um, but as, as we've talked about the last time we're in Peter, and as we understand, um, we're part of this, this great thing that God created called the church. And at the end of the day, what, what we need to understand, what Peter's trying to get across to these Christians, because he says in the beginning, of chapter 2, he says, Therefore put aside all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Uh, why does he have to say that? Because those, those things can, can happen in the church. Even, even during the midst of, of hard times, we can, uh, any family, if you're around them long enough, right, get on each other's nerves. Happens, right? We, uh, there, there's a reason why, for the most part, we have family reunions like once a year, not more than that, because, um, you know, and, and, and that, that's, just, that's just the way it goes. And not that we don't love each other, not that, but yeah, you know, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get on each other's nerves from time to time. It happens. Um, but, but Peter's saying here, yeah, yeah we're going to have those times, but, um, but there's something that we have so much, we have a bond that's so strong that, that transcends this world, and it's, and it's God, and we need, to under, we need to be reminded that, especially when we're going through persecution, especially when we're going through hard times, these, these things, <clears throat> um, we need each other, right? We need the body of Christ. We need to be reminded of those things. And um, and back in verse four, through that through that uh, that section, you know, Peter's reminding them, hey, that, that we need to have the the pure milk of the word. That that Christians, as Christians, like that's one of the things we we offer when when we gather together. We have this opportunity to um, to encourage each other, to build each other up in Christ, and and uh, and we do that by the word of God, right? But we do that also by by fellowshipping with each other. Um, he talked about how we're living stones, how we're not inanimate objects, we're not just, you know, dead stones, but we're living stones, and, and, and this building, um, this, this houses the church, because the, the people are the church, and, um, but, this, you know, when this building isn't in use, it's just a building, it's just there, there's no life in it, but once we're here, there's life, right? We'll come, come right after service when we're done, there's gonna be a lot of life, right? There's gonna be a lot of kids running around. I remember when we first got to this church, the church I came from, um, you know, when, when it came to kids, it was a big sanctuary, nice pews and everything. Like, uh, you know, there was ushers, like, stationed all around. Kids don't run around here, right? They, you get the stern look in your, in, your, uh, in your eye and all those things. When I came here, Zeke's like, you're just running around. And it was like, what are you doing? Stop running around. You know, you're, like, you're, 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 like, freaking out because that's what you're accustomed to. Um, but, you know, uh, that's the thing about Pastor Zeke. So I was like, no, this is their church. It's fine. They should be able to run out. They should feel free, obviously to an extent, right? Not the, you know, not thrashing the place or anything, but, but they, but they do. Again, once, once they're done, you're going to see, you're going to see a lot of life around here. And that's, and that's amazing. That's a, that's a glorious thing. And that's, and, um, and, and even after, you know, like usually we're here late, we close this place down, right? And, and that's, and that's amazing because there's fellowship that happens. There's this closeness that happens. And, and, uh, and we, we we're privileged to do those things because we're, because, um, the thing that binds us together is Christ Jesus. And, and maybe in any other circumstances, because our personalities are different, the way we do things, maybe we wouldn't, maybe we wouldn't be um, as close as we are, but because we have Christ as a center, we have this bond that, that's stronger than, than anything else. And so Peter is reminding the, these Christians who are going through that, that we need one another, especially during hard times. Uh, the the most times, because during during this time, this first century, a lot of these Christians, you know, they um, they were uh, especially the Jewish Christians, they were uh, disowned by their family because they stopped believing in Judaism. 
they believed they believed in Christ. So they, you know, they under the the way the culture worked back then, you know, the, the father still had all the authority. So he can be like, hey, you're out of here. You know, you're 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 cut off because, you know, you, whatever you're you're a heretic or you're a pagan now. So you you're believing something different, and so they had nothing. And, and what they had to do is they had to fall upon the church and the, and the care of the church, and that became even more so part of their family. And um, and so we see we see all this in here. We see this this uh, this thing that that God created, and it says that we're living stones that were built up. To, um, to a spiritual house to offer spiritual sacrifice, that we are a royal priesthood. All these things that he talks about, he reminds us that, that what we have in Christ Jesus, what we're, what we're about, because again, there's, there's times where you know, we can falter, right? We can get um, easily, uh, you know, again, caught up in our situations, not to, not to downplay anyone's um, difficulties or anything, but yeah, we can just focus on those things. And, and Peter's trying to remind this church to encourage them, hey, remember who you are in Christ, and because God went through great lengths to save you, to make you his own, he's not just going to leave you, right? He's not just going to leave you to fend for yourselves and all these things, but he's going to be with you. He's brought the church around you to, to, um, to, to lift each other up and to do all these things. As, uh, as Pastor Daniel's been in the Old Testament uh, a while back, he was in Exodus, and I, I remember the story, if you guys remember the story in Exodus 17, um, where the the Amalekites come into the picture. If you guys know that story, they start fighting against the children of Israel. Um, Moses, he he appoints Joshua to appoint men to go fight the battle, right? These aren't trained soldiers. These are farmers and and uh, shepherds, but they go out and it says that Moses goes up to, you know, to the to a hilltop so he can see the battle. He goes up with Aaron and Hur, and it, it says when he raises his hands that the, the children of Israel prevail against their enemy. But when his hands go down, it says the, the, the Amalekites start prevailing against them. And so his hands get heavy, right? Maybe we can do a, a little um, experiment to just try to hold our hands up the rest of the service, right? No, just don't do those things. But, but you understand, right? We do those things, uh, like we can only raise them. Even, even when we're singing, our, like when we're worshiping sometimes, it's like our, our hands get heavy. We want to keep raising our arms to the Lord, but, uh, but, our, but our arms and, and our hands get heavy. And uh, you guys know the story, Aaron and her, they... they Kind of sit uh, Moses down on the stone, and they hold his arms up, right? And that's a that's a great picture of of what how we're supposed to be for one another as Christians. We're supposed to lift each other up. We're supposed to hold each other up and and be there for one another. Now, again, obviously, as as uh, because on this side of eternity, we're not perfected, right? We're a work in progress. You know, we're gonna have our moments where, where we again we unintentionally hurt each other. We say things or or not say things, whatever it is, all these things, that those things can happen. Um, <clears throat> but even in the midst of all that, we're, we're called to be gracious towards one another because Christ is gracious towards us. And we're called to, to um, you know, to, to forgive. It says love covers a multitude of sins. And, and this is what Christ has done for us. And, and so we have all these things at our disposal when we're going through these difficult times and in our, in, our, in our lives that sometimes can shake our faith and the things that are going on, that we have obviously God himself, we have his Holy Spirit, we have his word, but he's also given us this amazing thing called the church and the, and the people in it where we can um, lift each other up and, and continue on. And, uh, and again, Peter is reminding them of all this, but at the end of these verses in verse, in verse, uh, in verse 7, he says, the, this precious value that Christ is precious to those who believe in him, right? And we understand that. We've realized that as, as we believed in Jesus, as he's forgiven us, as we realize all that he's given us, uh, to us in, in, a, in our sight, he's precious to us. But then he says this, he says, but those who don't believe that he's a stone, which the, um, he's, a, uh, he's a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, for they stumble because they are disobedient to the word and to this doom, they were also appointed, right? Sounds kind of heavy, huh? right? That's this is what Peter's saying. He's like, hey, the, 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 there, there, there is a choice in that matter, right? That we've we've seen it's been presented to us this gospel message, what Christ has to offer um, for us, for us who who have taken that, who've who've um, right uh, trusted in Jesus for our salvation. We understand He's precious in our sight, but there are those who, yeah, who aren't going to, right? Who are going to reject that? Who are going to? fight against that, and, uh, and it says that it's a, it's a, he's a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And it's because at the end of the day, they, they want to do their own thing, and, and he's kind of making this contrast now. And so as we get into verse 9, 
Um, he's going to tell us about who we are in Christ Jesus, these privileges that we have. And he makes a, a very sharp contrast. He says, again, at the end of verse 8, For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed. Verse 9, but you... Right? He says that in contrast because he's trying to, he's being deliberate in that contrast and telling them that uh, um, for us who aren't disobedient, for us who call upon the name of the Lord to be saved, we're, we are a privileged people. This is our identity in Christ Jesus. The, the first thing he says, but you are a chosen race. Maybe some of your versions say chosen generation. Again, I use the New American Standard Version, so, um, you know, there's that. But, but, uh, um, it says here, the chosen race or a chosen generation. And what this means, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it means a, a body of people with a common life or descent. Or, um, and, and basically the idea is that we are, because this, he takes this verse from, from the Old Testament, from Isaiah 43, verse 20, where it talks about the children of Israel being God's chosen people. But now he's, he's using that for us as well. He's saying that, that we're, we're part of this chosen people and and again we're not we're not trying to get it all too in the weeds because you know we can go on for days <clears throat> he's not saying that the church replaces israel i know there's a there's a teaching out there we could talk about that another day or after we can have coffee and talk about that all day all night it'll be great but um but what he's saying for us as as, as believers we have this privilege now that we're um you know we're not excluded right we're chosen from this i remember back in the day when like costco first opened you know when i was younger when we first when we first went there you, you go in, and it's like, oh, like they have, it's amazing, right? It's great. Uh, but then you realize, oh, you can't buy nothing unless you have an actual membership. And I was like, what is this? Right? Even at a young age, I was like, I don't like this idea. I don't like this exclusivity stuff. It's, it's kind of a, it's a bad deal. I mean, I, it still didn't stop me from going and getting free samples, right? But, but, that's, um, <laughs> but, but for us as Christians now, like we, we have this, right? Be, uh, back in this time, um, you know, the one true God was, was only, you had to go through one certain avenue, right? One certain thing. And, and uh, it was only one way through Israel. And, and even with that, even as a Gentile, you could, you can become part of the Jewish religion and, and serve the one true God. But there was always that, well, you're not, you're not an actual Israelite, right? You're not an actual Hebrew. But, uh, but then the new covenant comes along and changes those things and says, no, you're part of this. Now you, if, if you, if you're in Christ, then you're part of this chosen people, this chosen race. And it doesn't have anything to do with like generations, right? Like, uh, you know, I don't even know what the new one is. What is it? There's Gen Z, there's millennials. Who names all these people? I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know even, I don't, I don't remember asking anyone what they wanted to name my generation, but, um, <clears throat> but that's not what it means. The, the, the idea is, is the same idea that Paul talks to the Ephesians. It, it's this thing that we're a new creation, that we're kind of almost a new humanity because we are, we are in Christ now, right? Um, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says it this way, Therefore, if you are in Christ, you are a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Such a great verse, right? That's such a freeing verse, especially if, if you realize what, what Christ has done for you. Maybe you've had a lot of um, mistakes and things in your life. But the Bible's clear. All those old things have passed away in Christ. All things are new. And this is the idea that... that um, that Peter is reminding them, reminding these people, the church, that, hey, you're, you're a privileged people. You're chosen. God is with you. He hasn't forsaken you. He's, he's with you. But also with that, he says that you're a royal priesthood. This word royal means, means basically king. And the idea is like a, a king priest um, because now we are associated with Christ Jesus. In the Old Testament, um, you couldn't be a, a priest and a king at the same time. That wasn't, that wasn't allowed in, in the law um, there is one instance in Second Chronicles 26 where King Uzziah, he tries to do that, right? He says he gets proud because, you know, there's a lot of success going on in his life, and he becomes proud, so he goes and burns incense at, in the altar. And they try to stop him. They're like, hey, you can't do this. This isn't permitted. And he's like, I'm going to do it. And right when he's about to do it, it says that, that he's struck with leprosy. Right? And, and uh, you know, so, so that, that was the Old Testament. Those were the, the, that was the regulations. That was the rules. But now in Jesus, in, especially in the book of Hebrews, we have this idea that, that uh, it's, it's mentioned again and again that Jesus is our high priest. And it says he's the high, our high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. If you don't know who that is, that's like your homework for tonight. Because again, we don't have enough time to go over all that. But, uh, but if you look in the book of Genesis, we, we introduce this character Melchizedek. And, and it says he's a, he's a king, but he's also a priest. And, and it says that Jesus is in the order of that, that he's both our king, he's also our high priest. That's, that's, a, 
that's the office that he that he kind of uh, he's in right now, right? He's our high priest. It says he's daily making intercession for us. I don't know about you. I'm I'm, I'm thankful for that because I daily daily need intercession, right? Because I do a lot of dumb things, um, and uh, and so and so we we see this. We see that we have this as well. That because we're in Christ Jesus, we're we're we're, uh, we're this this holy priesthood, and just as we read earlier. Um, that we're we're built up to this holy um, the spiritual house to bring about spiritual sacrifices. That's that's what we get to do as Christians. And again, there's this understanding sometimes when we talk about as Christians what we're supposed to do. So we get to do these things. We get to serve the Lord. We get to serve in different capacities. Um, we get to serve one another. That that's part of of uh, of Christianity. We're we're serving one another. We're we're uh, we're regarding each other higher than ourselves. Um, this is Christianity. I remember when I was in Bible college, I was uh, in Germany, and um, there was one guy. He was a he was a Finnish guy, um, really cool dude. But he he like he had his like his routine. You know, he was I don't know. He, I mean, I don't know how old we were like in our early twenties. But he was like a he's like an old man. He he go to bed like eight o'clock. He's like, hey guys, I'm going to bed. And so it's like, oh, so we all have to be quiet now. It's like we want to you know we're not gonna go to bed till like probably one in the morning. What do you like? And uh, and so I remember. Um, you know, that was kind of a little, I don't know, uh, uh, bummer, I guess, right? I mean, you know, kind of a, a contention that shouldn't have been, right, a, a thing. Um, but I remember we were talking about it, me and him were walking one day, and he's like, I, we had just talked about Philippians. I forgot what we were talking about, but we were talking about regard each other higher than ourselves. And he's like, do you think I'm not doing that? And I'm like, well, I mean, you know, I, don't, I, I know you like your early rest. Maybe we'll get you some earplugs because, again, like, these are like twenty-year-olds. What, what, what do you want us to do? We, we're gonna, we're gonna go to bed at a reasonable hour. What does that even mean? I don't know. And so, and so, uh, but but uh, um, but serving one another in that capacity, we we all have um, we all have that as as Christians, not just not just a pastor, not just an elder, not just a leader. Like we're all called to um, offer up spiritual sacrifices to the Lord. And and Pastor Zeke mentioned this when he was last in. Um, in First Peter, about one of the main ones is our, is our, is our whole lives, right? In Romans 12, 1, it says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you um, present your body a living sacrifice, right? Dead sacrifices are easy to, to offer, right? Because they're, they're not going to do anything. But a living one, it's kind of like, eh, maybe, maybe at first I thought this was good, but now, I'm, yeah, I'm, I don't know, right? We, we, can, we can get in those ways. We can start, like, you know, kind of squirming our way off the altar because, like, yeah, I don't know, maybe not. Maybe not after all. And for us as Christians, and even for the church, that's that's what we're that's what we're called to do, and uh, and 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 that's the amazing thing that we have about the the church and the privileges that we do have that we're part of this this thing that we're you know we we're, we're included in this thing called the church and we're called to serve one another in the Lord and um, and the only way we're able to do that is if obviously if we're surrendered daily to the Lord yeah because again you know the times where um, there's any contention in any relationship, right? It's probably because we're focusing on ourselves and not on the other person, and that's, again, one day, right? One day we're going to be whole, we're going to be made perfect, away from sin, um, and until that day we're a work in progress, and we need to have grace with one another. And so as we continue on, he's he's he says this other thing. He's given us all these these points and all these privileges, this identification, and he goes on. Um, he says that we're a holy nation, and this word holy simply means set apart, right? That we're called to be different, that, that we're set apart to serve, uh, the, the definition is set apart for the service of a deity, you know, in, a, in, in our case, it's the living God, and that we're, because we're called uh, the people of God, because we're under God's authority, we're, we're, we're called to walk in God's ways, and again, He gives us the um, enablement to do that through His Holy Spirit. But He says that you're a holy nation, you're, you're a holy people, um, and you're called for my glory. And he says, and I, I love this this phrase. He says, a people for God's own possession. If you have like the King James or the New King James, it says you're a peculiar people. I love that word, right? We don't use that word a lot, peculiar. Um, but this is this is what the word means, and and it's not it's not how it means as we think of it. We think peculiar as weird. That's odd. That's strange, right? Um, this isn't what the word means. The word peculiar here has the idea of of. Uh, you know, you, there's something that you have, a possession you have, and then you encircle that possession. And uh, because it's something that's, that's unique, it, it, that, that's precious to you. This is what the word means. And, uh, and I love that because, because, again, God went through great lengths to 
to save you, right? He, he, it was at great cost that he saved you. And this is the idea like, a, you know, when we were younger, especially when we uh, first learned, um, we're, when we first got our first vehicle, right? When we were driving, we got our first vehicle, even though, even if it was like a beater, right? But it was ours. So we took care of that thing, right? Armor all the tires, all you don't do that in, in, in the high desert because the, the, the dirt sticks on there. It's not good. Um, but we did that, even, you know, uh, like um, all those things we did that, like my first car, I love that thing, had no power steering, had no air conditioning. It was great. Um, but it was like, it was mine. It was my own possession. So I was like, all right, I'm going to keep this thing clean. And, uh, and, and, and so um, even more so, right, God is saying to us that we're his unique own possession that again at great cost he um he purchased us for his for his own right for his own thing and uh, um you know I, i'm into collectibles and stuff so you buy certain collectibles um especially like you know they, I'm, I'm, I'm a kid at heart still so I like action figures mm-hmm. and you know you collect them because it's a rare one you put it on your shelf someone's like oh do you ever play with this i'm like what kind of monster are you? no it's not you don't do those things you keep them on the shelf right um but uh but that's not what god does right he 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 he, uh, he saves you, and, and then he uses, he uses us. It says, going on now, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And I love these verses because what you, kind of, what you see here, I don't know if you, if you see it, but as, as Peter's writing these words, I'm sure he's thinking about you know, when Jesus spoke to him, that in Matthew 5, 16, we know that verse that, that Jesus says, uh, let your light shine in such a way to all men that they will see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven, right? You kind of almost see, like, maybe um, Peter reminiscing about these, these words of Jesus and writing them down, because this is, this is the vehicle, this is what, what God uses to get his message across to his people. It's us, right? Um, later on, again, he's going to use different means towards the end times, if you read the book of Revelation, but right now he's using me and you to to tell about the excellencies of God. And this word excellencies, it means his gracious dealings, his glorious attributes. And God has been gracious to us, right? And, and so, and, and this is why we, um, we go out with the gospel message. This is why we share our faith. This is why we live out our faith. And, and, uh, and, and when he talks about being this marvelous light, it's, it's saying that we're participants in, in, uh, in the light that God is. We're, not, we're no longer in darkness anymore. And this has an effect on us. Uh, later on in the, the book of First John, which is one of my favorite verses, it says this. I forgot to write it down, so so bear with me. I'm just going to turn there and read it. First John, um, chapter one, verse five. This is what John says to the church. He says, "This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you, that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth." Verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, it says we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sins. I love that verse because it it's, uh, makes it very clear. It's like, hey, if, we, uh, if we're in the light as, as Christ is in the light, we're going to have fellowship with each other, right? There's no deception. There's, there's nothing, right? If, if things are exposed in the light, that's why there's a lot of people who don't like the light because they want to stay in the darkness and, and hide from those things. But for us as Christians, we, we've... Uh, We've been invited into the light of, of God and His holiness, and now we go out with that message as Christians. We're, we're called to do that. Even in the face of opposition, even in the face of, of, uh, of, of hard circumstances, um, uh, we just sung a couple, one of the worship songs we were singing, it talks about that, that God isn't done with us, that He uses all these things, even our mistakes, but even our hard times for His glory, He can use those things. Um, and I've seen it as, as long as I've been at this church, and, and you know, we have... Um, weddings in here, but we have, we have quite a bit of funerals. And you see through those things how, how, um, how God is with, with his people. Through the midst of tragedy, God is able to, to carry them through. And also through that, for, for them to even glorify God in the, in the midst of their circumstances. That's something only God can do. It's something because they realize what God has done for them, because they realize who God is. Because as, uh, as Peter says in chapter 1 of First Peter, that we have a living hope that we have something to look forward to that, that's, that's not temporal, it's eternal. And we continue on. And, and again, Peter is, is reminded of, reminded of those things because, again, we need those reminders on the daily. Hey, this is who you are in Christ Jesus. Hey, this is what God is doing in your life. Yeah, this is hard right now, um, but, but God is, is doing a work through you. And again, I'm not one for suffering, right? 
uh, or anything like that. But we have to, we understand that that um, as Jesus suffered, who is our master, who is our king, um, we can't expect to to not go to never be exempt from those things that we're going to do those things those things are going to refine us those things are going to do a work in our lives and that God is going to um, strengthen us through those things and he says in verse 10 now for you were for you once were not a people but now you are the people of God you had not received mercy but now you have received mercy and I, again I love this this last part because Obviously, we understand as, as Christians today that, hey, we're, we're Christians. We understand what God has done for us. Um, you know, maybe most of us had a Christian upbringing. But during this time, this first century, again, they were, they were kind of uh, outcasts. They were kind of in the dark and, and separated from these things. But, but now it's saying because of the new covenant that, 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 that Jesus uh, enacted at the, you know, when, he, when he died on the cross for our sins, that now we have access to God. Now we... Uh, these things that because again like back in back in these days you know if you weren't of the nation of israel you were a pagan right you were a heathen or whatever whatever they called you but basically you had no rights to god at all like god had nothing to do with you this was this was the understanding this was what was going on and so um but now it says for you once were not a people right you were expelled but now you are the people of god and uh, at once you had not received mercy. This is this was the understanding. You know, if you if you didn't know the living and true God, if you weren't a part of His people, guess what? Like you were you were under God's wrath and punishment. That was it. But that's not the case, right? We we all have we all have this opportunity to to receive mercy is extended to us because of of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And so this is what we have as privileged people. And again, um, Peter is reminding his people of those things and again we need that reminder daily um you know i again i always tell the youth and until i'm done doing youth ministry i don't know whenever that would be but but say hey like be in your word right open open the word of god daily you need to know you need to know god you need to know who christ is um it's it it can't be it's not enough for you to open on sundays and thursdays only it has to be a daily thing and we need that daily reminder. We need that daily strength. We need that daily sustenance from from the Lord, and and, uh, and it and it's through His Word, right? It's through His Word. It's through the fellowship of other believers. It's, it's through prayer. It's um, it's all these things. And again, Peter is reminding them of these things. And with now this privilege, he kind of goes into how we should act, right? How should we, how should we behave and navigate through all these things as Christians? And he says the first thing he talks about is beloved, right? That this word means dearly loved ones of God. It's not basically. It's not kind of saying like a you know like, like we would say like oh beloved we call it or each other that or or anything of that. Uh, but what he's saying is like hey it's another reminder hey remember you're you were dearly loved by God. Yeah, but I've been dealing with this or I've been dealing with I've been like you know. Upset or whatever the case is. Okay. Yeah, and and God knows how to you know walk you through those things, but understand you're still dearly beloved by God. Yeah, but my thoughts haven't been right, or I haven't been in the Word lately. You're, you're still dearly beloved by God because you belong to Him. Again, He went at great lengths to make you His own unique possession, right? And and so in verse eleven, He says, "Beloved, I urge you." Just the the same phrase that Paul used in, in Romans twelve that I urge you, I beseech you. And we have to remember when when Peter is writing this, this this is the Word of God, so this is God's Word. So it's almost that God is saying, hey, I urge you, I beseech you. And you see the love and the, and the gentleness behind God's word. He's God. He can be like, hey, do this now, right? We have kids, um, when, especially when they're younger, when you tell them, hey, do this. And, you know, maybe God on your skin, but it, it, it gets in their mind when they're like, why? What's our, what's our usual response? Because I said so, right? right? Are you guys are all there? Okay. It's not just me. Great. Great. I don't feel that bad, right? But, but, but that's what God could have done. He could have been like, hey, just do it because I said so. Like, don't freak out. You're fine. You'll be all right. Yeah, maybe you're going to get thrown to the lions in the Colosseum. Don't cry about it. You'll be fine. He doesn't say any of those things, right? He says, I know, I know. He says, I urge you, right? He urges them. He tells them, hey, like, I'm with you because Christ suffered, because Christ went through things that we went through. Like, he, he can sympathize with our weaknesses. And that's, that's a great thing because sometimes I'm not the best sympathizer or empathizer. I'm like, you're fine. You'll be all right. It's going to be fine. Um, but he says here, I urge you as aliens and strangers or, or, or uh, 
sojourners and pilgrims, maybe your, your version says, um, <clears throat> that uh, this, this word here, again, um, strangers and, and pilgrims, it has the idea of to have one's home alongside of, right? To settle down alongside, and this is the definition of, 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 of pagans. This is the idea. So we have to settle down among the unsaved, and, uh, and, but though as we are aliens among them, strangers, right? And this is the idea because the idea is always in, in Peter's mind that, hey, we're, again, we're not of this world. And as Christians, is this idea of holy and separation means that we're different. And so when he uses that, that word, um, strangers and aliens, even though we reside here for a time, um, not that we purposely or make go out of our way to, to be odd, but we're going to be odd because of, our, of the way we act, the way we conduct ourselves. And again, this was the issue that was going on during the time of these Christians. Right? Okay, these, these people are different. Um, they're definitely different than the Jewish people. Um, they're, they're kind of, they're strange. They're odd, right? They're peculiar people. What is it about them? And he tells them, hey, as strangers and aliens, you need to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against your soul. Again, in a culture that just, hey, do whatever feels right to you, right? It sounds like today's culture. Mm-hmm. Do whatever makes you happy. Uh, we're called to be obedient to what God wants us to, to do to be pleasing to Him. And this word here, He encourages them to abstain, which means hold yourself constantly back from. Why is that? Again, in, in, our, in our mentality today, abstaining from anything, it's like, what does that mean? It sounds like a bad word. It hurts, it hurts to even think of, what do you mean I can't just... Whatever, I can't just indulge in anything. No, you need to abstain. Why is that? Because we have a testimony, right? Because we have a testimony to maintain and a message to give. And, and we're called to, to be holy as He is holy. And again, we have to understand, like, yeah, we're going to trip up from time to time, but there's a difference from just going all out and, and abstaining from those things and, and, you know, every so often tripping up or whatever the case may be. He tells them, abstain from these things. Yeah, these things are... Their fleshly desires, their fleshly lusts, cravings, urges that, that are there, but they're not beneficial for you, right? As Christians, we understand that. Um, you know, the, the, the principle applies, like the wages of, of, uh, the wages of sin is still death. I don't know if you guys knew that, right? Like, uh, in, in, in a, a lot, unfortunately, a lot of churches today, they, they, they try to water down those things. And it's not that we're saying it because, oh, you know, we want to, we just like telling people what to do. It's like, no, it's going to, it's going to affect your life negatively. It always has from, from the dawn uh, when, when, the, when Adam and Eve first fell till, till now. It, it brings death. It brings destruction in your life if you, if you continue in it. Again, there's going to be times where we, where we falter and we slip up, uh, but that's different from actually living in sin, and it's going to consume your life. It's going to destroy it. And sin is never just done in, in a vacuum. There's always collateral damage with other people and other things, and and, um, and Peter is encouraging them, right? Again, he could have been, I'm the apostle Peter. You just need to do this. Stop doing this, right? Stop that or whatever the case is. But he's like, no, I urge you. It's, it's almost like he understands, hey, I get it. And I'm urging you. I'm exhorting you. I'm, I'm pleading with you. Abstain from these things because um, they're going to cause issues in your life. You're really dealing with issues. You're, really de- you're already dealing with persecution and all these trials. Um, why add on to it um, sin and and and, and you know, this, this severance of, of connection between you and God, because that's what it does, right? When we are in sin, like uh, there's a saying, and I, I think it's true, I don't know who said it or coined it, but it says, God never allows his people to sin successfully, right? If you belong to him, like, yeah, it's not gonna, it's not gonna feel great. Maybe for the, for the first, whatever, seconds or so, it's gonna be, oh yeah, okay, that, that was whatever, exciting, whatever the case is, but after it's like, there's just heaviness because there's conviction because you're not of the darkness anymore, you're of the light. You can't, you can't do those things successfully. And, and so he tells him, hey, because these things, these lusts, these fleshly lusts, they war, they wage war against your soul. It's pretty hardcore, right? If we look at it that way, because we're like, yeah, it's not a big deal. Yeah, it's a little thing. Yeah, you know, it's fine, right? So the enemy says, it. that's how he whispers. He's like, not a big deal. Just do it. It's fine. You'll be all right. But he doesn't realize, no, these things wage war against your soul. That's, that's what they do in the life of a Christian, and, and uh, you know, and, and again, um, that's what we plead with people all the time, say, hey, like, this is what the Word of God says, it's not just saying because we say so, or because we're like, oh, we're, we're pastors, we're leaders, don't do this, and we're like, you know, always looking down on people with a, with a disappointed scowl, or whatever the case is, it's like, no, because we've been there, we've understand, oh yeah, the, the wages of sin is death, it leads to destruction, it's, sin is only good for a season, it, it brings, it brings about 
destruction and, and despair and all those things. And if we can, if we can help you understand those things before you actually go into them, then, then you'll be better off for them instead of having to deal with the, with the ramifications of those sins. And so he tells them, right, that to do these things. Um, verse 12, it says, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. And when he says Gentiles, he doesn't mean those who aren't Jewish. He, he, the idea behind this word is those who are not saved, right? Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. And this word here, excellent, means honorable. Goodness, which is beautiful, and outward goodness that strikes the eye, right? That's the idea behind this word. Um, we, we give people an honest testimony of what's going on inside us by the way we live, by the way we conduct ourselves. And, uh, and yeah, those, we, we uh, you know, that's, that's what we do when, again, even, even, even with simple things when, again, we live in a very divided time. So, you know, there's always going to bring, people are always going to bring up whatever issues are going on in the world. And, you know, when we, when we answer them biblically, they're going to, they're going to look at you like you're peculiar, right? Like you're weird, like you're from another planet because you don't think the way they think. Um, and it, cause he even says that so that in the things in which they slander you as evildoers. What's he talking about? During the first century, uh, again, as Christianity was, was becoming more and more known, um, you know, they would have these things called love feast, which again, if you don't know anything about Christianity, you might say that sounds kind of weird, right? Because, I mean, yeah, that's the thing. But it was, it was basically potlucks, basically. That's why, that's why, you know, Christians do potlucks the best. That's because they, I mean, can't be dogmatic about it, but I'm pretty sure they invented it, so... Um, <laughs> But, but, the, but the, the Romans and the people around them, they're like, what are these people doing? What do they call it? They, they call it their agape feast because it's like, you know, we're getting together because we're one in Christ. We love each other. We're sharing meals with each other. Like, that sounds really weird and really immoral. And they would call them immoral. They say, these people are immoral. What are they doing? Um, they, they, they heard about communion, the Lord's Supper. What do they mean? They're eating the, you know, the flesh of, of the body of, of their Messiah and, and drinking his blood. That's that's cannibalism. That, that's, that's the slanders that were going on about the, about the Christians. They're like, these people are immoral. They're wicked people. That, that's what they were saying, that, that they were, they were uh, you know, in cannibalistic rituals and, and all these things. Um, and so that's, that's what they were seen as. And so, um, and again, it's easy for us to like, when, especially when we're slandered, we're like, that's not true. And we want to defend ourselves. We want to attack back or, or uh, any of those things. But Peter says it here, make sure, make sure that your behavior is excellent. So even the things they say about you that are wrong, that are, that are actually false, like there's, there's not going to be no, no backing of that. It's, it's, gonna, it's, it's not going to amount to nothing because your conduct, the way you behave, it shows that, yeah, you're, you're not that way. You're actually, you're actually different in a good way. You're actually different in a way that's, uh, that's not those things, that's not immoral, that's not anything that the world would do. And, and that's, that's what we're called to be. That's part of being a light is that we're going to call to be different. Again, um, let's be real. Some, sometimes, again, because we're a Christian family, yeah, there's, there's some Christians who maybe take it a little over the top, right? And, and, they, and, they, and they very much are, are uh, very deliberate and purposeful and they're letting people know, hey, I'm a Christian in a, I don't know, dare I say sometimes in an obnoxious way. It's like, hey, we, we should be able to do it without without being super over the top. I don't know, you know, um, but, but, uh, but that's, that's kind of the idea behind that because again, they were being slandered. There all these things were being told about them. Um, you know, the Bible's clear. Nothing's doing to the sun. We're still going to deal with those things, still deal with, with other slanders and Christianity. And it's, especially in our day and age now, it's, it's out of control with the, with all the avenues of communication we have. There's, there's all this, all this nonsense out there. Um, and if you try to chase all of them to try to correct people and, 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 and say, no, it's not true, this or that, like, I don't know, it's exhausting, right? Um, and, and what we need to worry about is, is what we're doing in our own lives, in our own, in our, in our own behavior, in our own, um, you know, trying to make sure we're excellent among those who don't know the Lord and being that light to our community, that light to our neighborhoods, whatever the case is. And he says this at the end, um, Again, that, that in the things in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. And again, maybe Peter's recalling when, when Jesus says Matthew 5.16, right? Let your light shine 
so that men will see your good works and glorify your fathers in heaven. Uh, I found this quote, and I thought it was good. I, I, I still think it's true today. Um, it says, this, The separated life of a Christian is one of the most powerful means God has of convicting the world of its sin. I don't know. I still think that's true today. Again, not that we're perfect by any means, but the fact that we live differently, the fact that we want to live pleasing to God and, uh, and are not going according to the course of this world, like, I think that's more attractive to a, a dark world than us trying to be like the world. Um, uh, I, you know, maybe I, I look at too much stuff on social media about Christianity and, and as, as a whole, uh, it'll, it'll frustrate you, right? Because you see a lot of things like, what are you doing? What are you thinking? Like, what, why, why, why would you do this? And you see a lot of churches trying to be relatable to the world, right? trying to be cool and hip. That, that's one of the worst insults you can give me is that I'm cool, right? Because that's because that means I'm trying too hard to be something I don't want to be. Um, but you see all these churches trying to be relevant and, 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 you know, like to be like the world so they can win the world. I, I don't know. Maybe that's a bold strategy. I, I think it's a, I don't, I think it's a, maybe a, um, a misguided one. I think our, our difference, our, our, our separateness, our holiness, not that we're the, we, we put ourselves in a bubble, but because we conduct ourselves in a manner according to the Word of God, and it, it's different from the world, I think that's more attractive to a dark world than trying to be just like the world, right? Because, again, even now you see it in, in the world, people are living after themselves and living off these things, and what are they, they're empty, right? They're empty, and they're looking for something else, and we have that. We have something that's, that's, that's actually eternal to offer them, and it's Jesus Christ. And that's uh, and it's it uh, it works in our it, it, for us if we actually you know live in a way that's 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 different from the world and that's pleasing to God and God is going to do work. It says that they're going to see God the, uh, because of their good deeds as they observe them, right? Because that's what happens. We 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 should understand that that as a Christian, if you even have even a little hint of Christianity, people are going to. They're going to be watching. They're going to see, okay, let's see. Let's see how Christian this person is, right? Um, but when you do this, is that they're the, when they observe you, that they're going to glorify God in the day of visitation. This idea, the day of visitation, comes from uh, Christ coming again in judgment. So what's he saying? He's saying at the end that, hey, we're, for, for some people, you're going to, you talking to them, coworkers, whatever it is, uh, you're going to be the only Bible they ever read at times, right? Because they have no desire, no concern for those things, but our life, our conduct, our speech, um, they're, they're going to be um, the Word of God to people. That every, every time we go out, every time we, we engage in the world, whatever it is, like the, the, there's an opportunity to, to be a light. Again, you know, um, as, as Pastor Zeke in Galatians, right, we can get very legalistic and be like, oh man, I messed up. Oh man, like, I got frustrated because I got cut off on the freeway. Now, like my, my my witness is blown. I don't know if it's that serious, right? But uh, you know, we can get very legalistic on ourselves. Um, but but at the same time, there there is this understanding. So okay, like you know, I'm going to Walmart, dealing with a lot of people. Lord, help my help my facial expressions to glorify you, because sometimes it doesn't, right? Or whatever the case is, or or online, or whatever the case is. Like th- those things, those things that happen. But he says in the day of visitation, because. As Peter writes this, as he's writing this book as well, he is he has in his mind as well that hey, one day Jesus is going to come back, guys. Like it, it's going to happen, and what do we are we are we ready for that? And for the unbelieving world, they're not ready, right? They're not ready because they they don't know Christ. Either they reject him just wholesale, or they're like, eh, it's not a, I don't believe it. But but one day they're going to believe, not because they you know they they surrender their lives to Christ, but because they're going to see, right? And and. Uh, and until that time, and in, in before that day, they have an opportunity um, to come to the Lord by, you know, through through our actions. Um, there's a saying, and I can like I only half like it, right? It's it's an older saying. It's like um, at all time preach the gospel, and when necessary use words. You guys know that one? You guys heard that one before? I like that, but at the same time, it's like I I'm maybe because I like talking, right, or, or communicating. Uh, I think both are necessary, but I understand the saying, right? I understand the, what they're trying to say. Like our, our life, our conduct should be that, that people would say, okay, yeah, there's something different about this person. There's something different about my coworker or whatever the case is because they don't engage in the conversations, the, the jokes or whatever the case is. Um, but at the same time, you know, Peter's going to say in uh, the next chapter, say, hey, um, 
always give, always be ready to give it a uh, give an account. Right? It's in First Peter three fifteen. Um, always being ready to make a defense for everyone to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Right? We that's where we kind of get the idea of apologetics. We should be able to communicate our faith, what we believe in, why we believe in it. Uh, that's why I tell the youth all the time, hey. You know, I know you guys talk in weird language um, that I don't understand. That's how you know you're older because, you know, like yeah. back in my day, they're like, you know, my parents or whoever, like, what are you talking about? Now kids are like, they say something, I have no idea what you said. Just talk to me, normal. I don't, I have very little patience for that. Lord, help me, but I don't. Um, but we should be able to communicate, right, the Word of God to people and, and, and uh, what we believe and why we believe. And if someone were to, I always tell the youth, hey, if someone were to tell you, like, how, what what is your Christian about? How do you how am I saved or what what's the how um, how do I how do I become a Christian or what's what's the reason that I'm a Christian? Whatever the case is, are you able to communicate that? Are you are you able to communicate the gospel message to someone who doesn't know Jesus, right? Because uh, um, and so you know we we should know we should at least know those, that that much, right? We should know those things and uh, and communicate Jesus Christ to people because again, hey. We don't know. The Bible's clear. We don't know the day or the hour. I don't know the day or the hour. Until that time, we're called to be faithful, to be in a light to, to everyone out there because one day God's going to come, and, and that day it's going to be a, yeah, it's gonna be a bad day for those who don't know Christ. But for us who know Him, it's going to be the best day, right? So with that, let's, uh, let's pray. I'm going to have Peyton pray us out this, this uh, evening.